one nation, under God. A nation forged on the sacrifice of pilgrims, pioneers, and patriots. Men and women who trusted God, who knew creation had much to offer, and who believed in something bigger than themselves. A nation grown strong through the vision of inventors, idealists, and innovators. We've given humanity wings, even sent them to the moon. We've done the impossible and haven't been afraid to roll up our sleeves and do the hard work. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And above all, we thank God for our Christian foundation the strength of our nation, and the many blessings he has bestowed upon our sweet land of liberty. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. God bless America. Hello everyone, this is being recorded uh, shortly before Independence Day, the great celebration of uh, 4th of July here in the United States. And I've been praying about and trying to discern what would be the best message to bring for this uh, particular holiday. And the more I looked at it, the more I prayed about it, the more I thought about it, I came to the conclusion that I needed not to really speak about the independence and greatness of the United States, but of our great Savior, who is a Savior of all nations. And so I want to look in Isaiah chapter 52. Now I was reading a book that my uh, childhood pastor had given to me. And that book listed Isaiah 53 as one of the great chapters of the Bible. And I was reading through that and realized that as he's talking about Isaiah 53, he really started at Isaiah 52, the last few verses. So let's look at God's word today. Isaiah 52, verses 13 through 15. Some translations title this, The Exalted Servant. And that's the title I wanna use for our message today. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were appalled at you, my people, so his appearance was marred beyond that of a man and his form beyond the sons of mankind. And so he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what they had not been told, they will see. For what they had not heard, they will understand. The prophet Isaiah provides the most unusual, the most exciting, the most intriguing description of the cross of Christ, what Jesus did for us on the cross. And Isaiah gives us a very sharp interpretation of the most dramatic moment in history, 700 years before it ever happened. Now that's a prophet. Notes in the Adrian Rogers Legacy Bible rightly tell us that Isaiah foresees a savior sent from God. Isaiah predicts a full restoration of Israel. He even sees to the end of time, a time when good is going to triumph over evil. We're not at that time yet, but it's going to come. And Isaiah saw a time when the Lord establishes a new heaven and a new earth. What a blessing that is going to be for people who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Throughout the entire book, God does something amazing. The Lord explains through the writing and preaching of Isaiah, God's greatest works before they ever happen. 
Now, Isaiah saw the Lord and angels in that tremendous worship experience that he described in Isaiah chapter 6. He saw that in person, and yet while he's there seeing the Lord and those angels, no one else in the crowd saw what Isaiah saw. And it was right in front of them. But Isaiah also saw the cross centuries before it happened. And over multiple chapters in the New Testament, we see a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ as teacher, as prophet, as evangelist. And that was the earthly life of our Lord Jesus. Well, Isaiah also saw Jesus. He saw him as a suffering servant. He saw him as a prophet who gave his life for us. Isaiah saw him as one who bore our sins. Kyle Yates called Isaiah 53 the Mount Everest of Old Testament prophecy. Uh, that's the book I was telling you about that my pastor gave me. Uh, it's a book by uh, Dr. Kyle Yates. The Mount Everest of the Old Testament. The Psalm of the Sufferer. But as I mentioned a moment ago, it actually starts here at the end of chapter 52. And so we're just going to look at the 52 portion of this tremendous message from Isaiah. Verse 13, he talks about, uh, we have the words, my servant. And it implies the favorite of the father. And his work is going to end through victory. Even though now he is inconspicuous, he is unappreciated as a servant of the Lord. And verse 13 also says that he acts wisely. It involves a word that has double meaning, both acting wisely and being successful. The Hebrew word hiskil means having insight. So you have insight, you see what to do, and then when you do it, it works. There's an idea of moving forward to fully complete the purpose of God. That's what this servant is doing. Also, the little phrase raised up is here. It can mean placed in a high position uh, or elevated to a high position. You see, the servant did not start at the high position. He's moving to that higher place. Our servant is not starting with triumph. He starts with suffering. He starts with humiliation. He's not starting with victory, but he's going to end with victory. And that victory is not just for the servant. That victory is one that we too can enjoy with life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you a little theology here. The Bible teaches that Jesus is God. There are so many cults uh, in this uh, world today, uh, <clears throat> many around the United States, we've got a couple just down the street from our church. They teach that Jesus is not God, but the Bible does. The Bible makes it clear that Jesus is God, especially in the New Testament, but even here in this passage, these terms exalted, lifted up, those are terms that are also used in Hebrew to apply to God. These same words describe the servant. Describing this servant are words that can be used to praise God on high. To be highly exalted is to be tall, to be high, to be exalted as God is. This servant, Jesus, is God. The picture of exaltation and praise and success needs to remain in our mind as we read the rest of the passage about the servant. He would receive uh, accolades, uh, as it were, that otherwise are reserved for God himself. This work by the servant is going to be completed. God's plan of salvation for us will be successful. And the work of the servant points to a future glory. So Isaiah's writing about it, looking ahead hundreds of years and knowing that Jesus is going to be successful in offering salvation and eternal abundant life to us. This servant, we know him as Jesus Christ. 
These words here are telling us he has keen insight. He acts properly, even in uh, terrible ordeals. He knows the plan of God. He is going to complete the plan of God. There's suffering, but after suffering, there will be positive results. There's humiliation, but glory and exaltation are going to follow. The servant, Jesus, knows what he's doing, knows where he is going, knows why this must be done, knows what to expect at the end. Verse 13 is God speaking to the people about the servant. Now verse 14 begins with God through Isaiah speaking to the servant. Verse 14, the prophet contrasted this very positive portrait uh, that's given from God with the expectation of the people, the multitudes of people. They're expecting uh, a, a, a Messiah that is uh, greater than a king. Well, Jesus is greater than the king, but that's not how he is when he's here on this earth and he's just not what the people expected. The Hebrew text describes this uh, is in a testimony form. Let me give you another translation uh, of 14. Just as many shuddered or were appalled because of you, so disfigured from, meaning beyond man, disfigured from looking like a man would look, his appearance and his form from uh, or beyond the sons of man. They are seen... And that's the way Jesus is going to look on the cross uh, in, in a very horrific view. That's not what the people are expecting or think that their leader, their Messiah is going to be. That Hebrew word translated astonished means the people were utterly amazed. New American Standard Translation uses the word appalled and others do as well. I think that's the best word to use. In Mark chapter 2, recently we looked at the story of Jesus healing the paralyzed man. Remember the guy who was brought down through the roof by four friends. And after he was healed and Jesus forgave him of his sins, the people were amazed at what Jesus had done. But Isaiah is prophesying about something. It says they are amazed in some translations, but he's prophesying about the sight of the beating, the torture, the crucified Christ. Appalled is a better translation. The sight is going to be more than the people can take. The blood, the shame, the gruesome sight of death. As a pastor, I've done many funerals through the years and sometimes uh, riding in the hearse with the funeral director we'll get to talking and time or two they have told me some stories of some very gruesome things they had to do in their role as a funeral director and they would often indicate even though they had dealt with death over and over again sometimes for years then they would encounter something beyond what they ever expected to see Yet they lived through it. They worked through it. And Isaiah is describing the gruesome picture of death. It's Jesus on the cross. Dr. Yates wrote uh, several decades ago that Isaiah pictures a sufferer, one who is suffering in the agony of death, too disfigured to be recognized, too pathetic to be attractive, to deep in humiliation and shame to be chosen. That little phrase uh, uh, that Dr. Yates wrote, too disfigured to be recognized. Uh, my mother told of uh, the afternoon that my father had a heart attack and, and died rather quickly at home. He'd had an asthma attack that probably brought on the heart attack. And Dr. Walker, he'd been my doctor as a child. Uh, he'd been our family doctor for probably decades. He came to the house. He came to the house. 
and he had treated my father no telling how many times for how many years. But my mother was a bit upset. Dr. Walker looked at my dad and said, who is this? You see, sometimes in death, the, the disfigurement, the change, uh, the, the gruesomeness of death is so horrible that we can't even recognize it. And Jesus on the cross, the one who gave his life for us, uh, was difficult for people to even recognize. Isaiah is prophesying that the people would be horrified at the physical appearance of the servant. And some would even say so at the cross. He no longer looked like a human being. And what could have caused this? How could such a person expect exaltation? How could a person hanging on a cross expect success? Well, verse 15 begins with a statement that's very difficult to understand in the context. The Hebrew apparently reads, just so he will sprinkle many nations. The earliest Greek translators understood the text to mean that he shall astonish many nations. Hebrew word is hizah, uh, translated sprinkle in many translations, but that's not what it means. The literal meaning is spring or leap. The Hebrew grammar means a sudden movement of astonishment, like startled, startled and you jump. I saw just a few days ago a video of a dog and a horse out in a pasture and they're checking out a turtle on the ground. The dog's there first and the horse comes up and sniffing. And all of a sudden that turtle moves. That horse looked like he about had a heart attack. He jumped and he uh, stomped and he took off running as fast as he could. The dog as well. Uh, I'm not sure, but what the horse actually stepped on the dog at some point trying to get away from there. They were startled and it was hilarious. It wasn't funny what happened to our Lord Jesus Christ. The people were startled at a horrific sight. Jesus on the cross. People would be startled at the sight of the innocent servant on the cross. And then they're going to be startled at his victory. His victory over death. His victory at the resurrection. They're going to be astonished. How did that happen? He died on the cross. And three days later, the grave is empty. And then for days, for weeks, he's walking around alive. How is that possible? Because his servant is the Savior. Verse 15 has the little phrase, many nations. Revelation 5, 9, Revelation 7, 9, Revelation 11, 9, and Revelation 14, no, not 9, but verse 6, all talk about people in heaven. And who's going to be there? There will be people in heaven from every nation, not just many nations, every nation. And more specifically, from every language, from every tribe, from every people group. It's said four times in the book of Revelation, everyone has an opportunity to be in heaven, eternal life with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Isaiah is writing that uh, he's going to astonish who? Many nations. And actually it's bigger than what Isaiah saw. It's all nations, every nation, even nations that did not exist at the time of Isaiah, some that came into existence, some that uh, have uh, gone out of existence. The eternal impact of Jesus is worldwide, not just one nation, not just Israel, not just the United States every nation. And there's a phrase there in verse 15 that kings shall shut their mouths. Uh, the idea here is that they're reali realizing who the suffering servant really is. Even kings are going to get a glimpse or maybe a hint of 
the fact of who Jesus is. He's the one that's suffering, but he's really one who is to be exalted. He's the one who's suffering, but he really ought to have a high place in God's plan, and he does. The world's leaders are speechless as they consider how high the authority of this servant really is, but also they are speechless as they realize the cost, the cost of that glory and that exaltation, that honor that Jesus will have and does have today. The cost, death, death. He died on the cross for you and I to pay for our sins. When they realized that's what it takes to get to that kind of level, uh, they were speechless. Our nation has a freedom that came at a high cost. The Revolutionary War, our war of independence. The Civil War to free the slaves. Multiple wars in the 1900s to keep freedom and uh, continued uh, military uh, action even uh, after the year 2000 and uh, even currently to keep our freedom and to give freedom to others, to other nations, to other people. But all of that earthly political freedom is temporary. Jesus offers eternal life, eternal freedom from sin, eternal freedom from suffering, eternal freedom from death. Jesus is the exalted servant. Let me close with a prayer, uh, paraphrasing it just a bit, but it's a prayer from uh, Matthew Henry. May all opposers to our Lord see the wisdom of ceasing from their opposition and be partakers of the blood of Christ, that blood that paid for our salvation and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, obeying him and praising his salvation. I pray that if you are in any way in opposition to our Lord, that you will cease that opposition and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. He is the exalted servant. He came to serve us, serve our Heavenly Father. And that gift that he has given to us is life, forgiveness of sin, and eternal life. If you've not yet trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, I encourage you to go to our website, centralalameda.org. Click on the connect button and connect with us. I would love to help you in your walk with the Lord. Let me know how I can help you, and I'd love to do that. May God bless you.